This episode, I'm joined by Brian Counter to discuss Gilles Deleuze's text, Proust and Signs. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep everything running because it's done so entirely off donations and patrons, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Brian Counter, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetic's podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, Deleuze's Proust and Signs, or Proust et les Signes, which was published in 1964 originally, and then I'm not sure when the first English translation was. Uh, it was translated most notably by Richard Howard. I don't think that there's been another translation. First published in 2000 uh, as Proust and Signs. Uh, probably one of the more, ironically, one of the more accessible Deleuze texts and yeah. also one of the least talked about, I would say, at least from my experience with Deleuze. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, I, I would agree because this, you know, preparing uh, for this conversation has made me really think about this text, not only um, in terms of what Deleuze is doing, but also in the critical context. And I think that in terms of the scholarship, and I'm sure we'll get to this, um, you know, having having read a lot of Proust scholarship, what Deleuze does here is like very precise. And I was I was actually just listening to the episode with Craig Lundy about um, Bergsonism, and Deleuze is certainly somebody who cares a lot about precision. So I think his his even from the very beginning, what he's doing, uh, he really wants to be precise about what happens in Proust. So in that way, he's really going against the grain of a lot of Proust scholarship, uh, and that's I mean making this therefore a very uh important text for anyone who's uh thinking about proust I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well before we uh jump in of course with um proust and signs and deleuze's work uh with proust um yeah just uh, i guess tell us a little about bit about yourself um and you know what why 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 was this this book this book in particular interests you so much and how how, how you first got so interested in deleuze yeah, so I'm uh, I'm finishing my PhD in the next couple months at uh, this SUNY Buffalo uh, in Buffalo, New York, um, and uh, Proust is really my main my has been my main uh, figure for years now, um, and I guess I would say my my dissertation is about aesthetic experience. So between kind of literature and philosophy. Um, you know, what is aesthetic experience? How do we recognize it? What are its, I guess, limits or boundaries? And I, I think I, so I came up uh, against a lot of fascination, but also frustration in my undergrad, uh, which I I did also a, a long thesis in my undergrad about Proust and Kant. Mm. Um, and I focused on the idea of the sublime. And I think what I realized back then was that, um, you know, not to, uh, you know, criticize philosophy, but I think that literature can do something philosophical that philosophy still has a hard time doing. And I think Deleuze is one of those figures who is attentive to that and really tries to make some interventions to show us how, um, and I think he does it here, you know, to show us how there's this way of thinking that's truly is against doxa. And a lot of it depends upon, um, maybe getting away from like the idea of examples or concepts or something like that. And I think that reading literature allows you to do that, right? Like a, reading a 10 page passage of literature versus a 10 pages of Kant or whatever, you know, there's, there's, you can do a lot. Maybe it's, maybe there's more license with the literature. I don't know. Um, but it, anyway, back then I read uh, Proust and signs and I just, it's been a very important text for me ever since. So I guess for, almost 10 years now mm. i return to it every once in a while yeah mm. i wholeheartedly agree i find myself now after sort of i guess years of tackling the big tough philosophical texts finding myself with much more appreciation and you know it's a, the key key word you use there is you can do a lot more with it it's sort of more malleable and uh mm. internalizes a lot, a lot more you're not left with this sort of strange blueprint which is plucked out all the uh I don't know the living stuff, right? That's that's the beauty of literature, and I think, I think um, this this I guess the post structuralist era of philosophy, uh, especially we were talking about before we started, Michel Serre. Mm -hmm. Um, th this is something they're emphatically struggling with, but also some of them are, 
are actually drawing it in because they realize that they need to overcome their limitations. I mean, Leotard often wanders into the poetic. Sarah himself is often passages yeah. of prose and, and poetry. I mean, Deleuze doesn't do that so much himself. But, well, you could say perhaps, perhaps with Deleuze and Guattari, they, uh, they occasionally yeah. go off on some strange little tangents. But it's still a, yeah. it's still sort of uh, a little textbooky. I don't know. But um, – sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to say, I think even, even – um... Uh, just ethically, I guess, right? It's a it's a question of method or ethics or something about how we treat a text. And I think that um, I was also going to mention Maurice Blanchot, who's another one who you know was also a novelist and uh, wrote creatively. But his um, yeah, his scholar, all of them are somehow between literature and philosophy in a way. I think that's that's pretty unique. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well. Uh, of course, as I know you're a listener, so I'll have to ask you the Hermetics question before we really get into the, the depths of Deleuze. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? Okay, so yeah, assuming that uh, maybe Proust and Deleuze are in the area sure. already, sure. Uh, I would say Friedrich Nietzsche, Maurice Blanchot, who I just mentioned, uh, and Samuel Beckett. And I think there's, I didn't really try to do this, but I guess thinking about this question made me just almost through reflex, think of the thinkers that I always come back to. And really, you know, Deleuze, Proust, Nietzsche, Blanchot, Beckett, um, there's something about all of them. I and, and trying to kind of condense it or summarize it, I think that they all thought about thinking mm-hmm. in a very, in different ways, but also, in a, again, like a, against the grain, um, they all uh, were concerned. I mean, I think as Deleuze says in Difference in Repetition, uh, concerned with getting away from presuppositions and and because that's such a difficult thing to do um i think that's what drove you know drove their bodies of work um and then in more particular ways all of them kind of form a nice network you know um mm-hmm. deleuze was certainly influenced by blanchot he wrote about beckett nietzsche and proust of course um beckett one of his first texts was a his his long essay on Proust, which is still one of the best. If I was going to say another like really good text on Proust, Beckett's uh, Proust book is great, and I think certainly uh, influence what Deleuze does mm-hmm. in certain ways too. Um, and then you know Nietzsche as well. You know, there's even in Nietzsche already there's this attempt to kind of like think more critically about what happens, what the subject is, what happens when we're thinking, if we can even say I, like what it means to say I. Um, so, but at, at the same time, they would all, even if you put Nietzsche in a room with another Nietzsche, they would probably disagree. So I think it would be a very interesting yeah. conversation. And I'm, I'm, I wonder what would happen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting room of now five people that almost seems like a scale of that discussion that we were having there about what, what sort of how how intense is their relationship with literature or philosophy? It seems, I don't know, mm. I guess I'd place like Sam Beckett with his sort of at certain points with his minimalism at one end and then Deleuze really at the other end being at, at times a philosopher's philosopher and then that scale yeah. sort of running through. I'm not sure where I'd place Nietzsche though. Um, I mean, like you said, at different times of his life, he's, he's well, he's everything, right? He's He knew yeah. he was going to die and he went, right, I've got to do every style under the sun and just get on with it and yeah. push it all out. Hmm. So that room it, for you, it seems then is is this is a real primary discussion of you know, you were mentioning your your own background there, writing about the limits of aesthetic experience, and it seems like that room really is about the limits of certain things we define, and mm-hmm. you know, be it philosophy, be it literature, be it poetry, be it prose. What are the limitations of this sort of form that we've somehow, sort of unconsciously or unspokenly, given ourselves? Sure, and 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 I would add to that too that all of these thinkers were very you know, we don't think, we think of, uh, we don't think of them as like, co- you know, committed r- writers, you know, <laughs> I- ironically, but they were all very committed to, you know, what it is to be alive. You know, I mean, Nietzsche, Deleuze, Blanchot, all of them, they all, you know, they all suffered, they all had joy, you know, they all had this deep experience of life. And that's what drove their philosophy. They weren't simply trying to analyze things and write books, you know. Um, so I think that there's, there are real stakes there. And that's another thing that really, add some life into their work um it's it's easy it's not difficult to see for example reading nietzsche that he 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 really cared about what he was writing about you know agree or disagree like you you know he mm. he he had real stakes in it so absolutely absolutely i mean it's a tough question because we'll never know but what do you think proust would have made of deleuze 
That's yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Proust is a really, um, I think if I, th- the thing that happens with Deleuze, and I don't know if you would agree this, this book, you said that this is maybe one of his most accessible books. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, what happens with Deleuze sometimes, which can also happen with Proust, is that, you know, on page one, maybe you're right there with him. You totally understand the logic <laughs> and you agree. And then on page five, he there's some turn that happens or there's some step that's made that you kind of lose the plot a little bit. And that, this happens with Deleuze for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know. I would say... That's an interesting thought experiment. I guess I, I I do think about this sometimes because Proust was so, you know, famously before he wrote uh, In Search of Lost Time, he he took uh, St. Beauve to task for doing like, you know, literary criticism that depended too much on the biography of the writer. So he was a classic example of bad, you know, literary scholarship that would say, oh, you know, so-and-so wrote this way because this happened in their life or, you know, almost mm-hmm. like the psychological criticism. Um so I think that Proust would appreciate how Deleuze sees um, like experience mobilized in a different way within the text, um, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Because because even you know even people were reading Proust and thinking that it was an autobiography or something like that, which he emphatically was not doing. You know, um, mm-hmm. so I, I think and this is something that could be said about my Hermetics room as well is that both thinkers really tried to keep paradox alive and I, I think that's um maybe a point of agreement with both of them the ability to think these kind of contradictory things or um or see how something's working in a in a way that's very different from what we would commonly assume mm. do you think that's why Deleuze's text you mentioned at the start there do you think that's why Proust in science is so strange that when it enters into paradox it's trying to do so as you said precisely yeah, I, I would think so. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I maybe it's maybe I should say a little bit more or maybe we should just start talking about the book a little bit more because I think I think, um, you know, Proust and Signs is a very interesting book because it's not at all a book of literary scholarship. Right. There's no there's no close reading. There's not a method that you could repeat elsewhere. Right. It is a philosoph- it really is a philosophical text. And he doesn't I'm not sure that he says this explicitly, but I think it's a text about aesthetic experience, you know, I mean, the the opening gesture is, is to say that, you know, the search of lost time is not about memory, which is, again, like a huge slap in the face of a lot of assumptions about Proust, right? We mm. think that it's, you know, that it's this beautiful poetic thing about reveries and, you know, about art and things like that. But we, you know, for a long, I think a lot of, um, a lot of writers, a lot of readers didn't really interrogate it beyond that. And were content to simply say, and, and it is, it is a temptation. And I think Deleuze is critiquing this within Proust as well as, as a reader of Proust, but there is a feeling when we read Proust that, ah, oh, like I, you know, I, I identify with this. This is record. I mean, the first time I read it, I, I certainly um, recognized what he was talking about as a feeling. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, and Deleuze's, big gesture I think within the book is to say that's all good but there's another step you know like that's that's habit that says oh let's just have this joy or something but really there's something philosophical about that that takes um that takes more effort I I guess Mm. I mean Um, dare I ask what do you think that step is I think it's so here we go this is (laughs) I think it's a hard I think it's hard I don't know if Deleuze um he doesn't really tell us how to do it, you know? I mean, is getting to, you know, getting from the sensuous signs, right, to the signs of art. There's that chapter where he talks about essence, which I think is the probably the most difficult chapter in this first half of the book. Um, and to me, I still, I don't know. I, I feel I feel like it's a little bit circular and I, I I'm not... Like I, I see what he's doing, but I don't know if I, if I'm fully there yet. I guess. Um, and I think the other thing to say too is that, um, you know, in search of lost time is famously a book which includes uh, an aesthetic theory near the end, right? And I think that 
there is the danger, which I don't think Deleuze is doing, but there is also a danger of like conflating the nar- the narrator's theory with Proust's theory. And I think this is another level where we can get into that discussion of, you know, what you can do with literature, right? Mm. Because, because I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with this passage, but there's a whole part where the narrator has like several involuntary memories one after another. So he stumbles on these paving stones. And then I think there's the feeling of a napkin reminds him of something. He hears a sound. And then right around that part, he says, uh, he's, it's just kind of this monologue. He's talking about works of literature that have, he's criticizing works of literature that have their theory within them. And then he goes on to do that very same thing. He says that works of literature, which contain their own theory are like articles at a shop that have their price tag on them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to give this like 30 to 50 page long description of, you know, the immortal soul and how involuntary memory and art are linked in this, you know, um, this, this way, uh, yeah, so mm. I don't know. And do you think that's why why Deleuze he sort of immediately moves away from memory because perhaps he believes that Proust actually isn't. So Proust is making this sort of in in joke, this paradoxical joke of doing the thing which he says he's not doing. But do you think Deleuze actually reads him as not actually doing that and there's something else going on at a deeper level there? And that's why Deleuze is so sort of emphatic and bold with like basically the first line being, this book isn't about memory. I think so. And, I, you know, I think that just like we were talking about before we started, you know, I wonder if Deleuze, at least in this first section, was really trying to, like, hack the tree down, as you I think, as you put it, and, and stay because he's a very dogged thinker. Right. He will he will he hammers his point home repeatedly. Um, and some of the chapters even begin and end in, with very similar statements. Um so there is this kind of repetition that happens even across books. I mean, the image of thought is something that comes up in Difference in Repetition and the Nietzsche book as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder if he was trying to stay. I mean, again, the fact that he I think there's one fairly long quotation from Proust in this in the part that we read. But, um, you know, there's not much quotation. There's no close reading. You know, it, it's the text in a way is basically taken at face value when he does quote Proust. Mm-hmm. Like he's not attending to the language he's not but he is doing you know he's he's reading it almost as philosophy now that i think of it right like he's reading these statements and saying this oh this is why you know we can kind of logically um say that you know but yeah i i wonder you know the thing about memory um yeah i think we can't we can't necessarily take the narrator as standing in for proust in any kind of direct way i mean proust himself was obviously aware of that and yeah i think maybe it was as you said like a, a bit of a joke partly because a long a lot a very committed joke if to you know spend one's life making i guess but um mm-hmm. yeah so where does where does you know as per reference to the to the title what do signs come in for this where does this begin to sort of build atop this immediate sort of meta textual reading which is ultimately a philosophical reading which is like okay you haven't even given us an excerpt of the book you're just demanding things where does signs come in to begin to sort of build some sort of uh method yeah so so Deleuze basically again right from the beginning says that um essentially sets the book up as or Proust text as a um a buildings roman he says it's an apprenticeship to signs and then he also says it's the apprenticeship of a man of letters so and there's a lot of, you know, uh, I guess disagreements and a lot of ink has been spilled about the question of, um, which I don't think you can say with any authority, but the question that, you know, the book we're reading is in fact the book that the narrator goes on to write later in his life, you know, which is, I don't know. I mean, I I, I, I tend to disagree with that, but I think that it is an important, I guess, impossibility to keep in mind or an important paradox to, to keep alive. Um uh, but yeah, with with the idea that the narrator is somebody who wants to write, who mm-hmm. is invested in art, and more importantly, an aesthetic experience as it happens in his life, um, he therefore needs some kind of training before he begins writing. And that training is not going, you know, going to a workshop or or sh- you know, shadowing a plumber. It's uh, it's living life, wasting time. You know, like it, in a way, it, it you know. Uh, and we can talk about the the question of Platonism, but in a way, it reminds me of um, 
the platonic dialogues in so far as there are all these missteps and corrections that happen. And and here, rather than obviously it's not a dialogical text, it's a it's a literary text or I mean it's a narrative, but um there are all these moments where it seems like the narrator detaches from the hero and um you know, makes an intervention later in time, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or anticipates. And, and Gerard Jeanette writes about this in his um, uh, narrative discourse. He talks about the iterative. So mm-hmm. Proust uses uh, the iterative tense, which is when you when you refer to time, like even the first line, right? L- like for a long time, I I would go to bed early, and so mm-hmm. that just means like it's one sentence is containing all of these repetitions. Um, so there's a lot that happens with time and. Where signs come in uh, is linked to that because of interpretation. So the narrator is constantly critiquing his own experiences, believing one thing, finding out that it's false, you know, like having this enthusiasm for an actress and then going and see her perform and he's disappointed, you know, so he has to learn these things just um just over time. And and I think that the, the the thing that's difficult about signs is that it's not as if he really has a teacher, right? So there's an unfolding that happens um, that's that's kind of like an autocritical uh, enterprise, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I just want to take a second here to talk about the Partially Examined Life podcast. If you're looking for an excellent philosophy podcast, here is the show for you. The Partially Examined Life is a philosophical podcast by four guys who are at one point set on doing philosophy for a living. For each episode, they pick up a text and chat about it with some balance between insight and flippancy. You don't have to know any philosophy or even have read the text they're talking about to follow and enjoy. With a 13-year-plus catalogue of episodes, The Partially Examined Life has probably covered any philosophical topic you're interested in, from practical ethics to the theoretical foundations of science. They go deep into the history of philosophy while making it personal and funny. Join the other 45 million downloads already pondering with The Partially Examined Life. Find new episodes wherever you stream your podcasts or at partiallyexaminedlife.com. It's this strangeness of time, and I mean, especially in respect to memory, I mean, that, that, that notion for Deleuze would, of course, be way too straightforward of this sort of linear um, memory that you just go back to and pluck what you want from it. I mean, of course, you have this Deleuzean temporality, which is sort of indexing from certain moments out into different uh, constructions to give the probably the most simplistic way I could form of understanding Deleuzean time. And... and <laughs> It's interesting then that in this sort of immediacy of saying, look, this isn't about memory, the the methodology which um, Proust is undertaking, it really jumps back to what we've been talking about as whether, you know, what, what this line is between literature and philosophy and what Proust is exactly trying to achieve in the way that he's writing. Um, mm-hmm. what, I guess just to try and widen the specifics of it, to be specific like Deleuze, what does the sign do and where does it where does it take us? How does it unfold? Because it doesn't have that if if we're going off the Deleuzean reading, it doesn't have that distinct connection to memory. So how does a sign function, I guess, for Deleuze? Yeah, so signs uh concern truth, or I guess he says truth is concerned with signs, I think is how he puts it in the book. So yeah, so signs and he has this whole hierarchy. I guess I can I can just quickly so there are the worldly signs, which largely is is, you know, he says they're empty. They are just meaningless, but they indicate um, for example, social status, uh positionings within some kind of milieu. So so the worldly signs are kind of just the first step, right? They're the first thing where the narrator will go to some, you know, dinner and notice, oh, someone made a faux pas, like we can see how there's this weird fallen aristocracy or these different uh figures that are circulating and they have these you know in different contexts they relate differently to one another because of their their statuses and also the signs they put out into the world um there are the signs of love which he says um they individualize um the loved one right so so there's the you know um the uh, the band of young girls on the beach right like 
who slowly become differentiated in the hero's mind until there's Albertine, there's Andre, there. So there are all these different ones, but first they're kind of this mass, right? And then the signs that they emit enables them to be differentiated. Um, mm. And then there are the sensuous signs, which are, you know, I guess most famously the the signs of involuntary memory. Um, so this would be, you know, the the Madeleine and the famous early scene where you know he dips it in the tea and then has this experience where. Um, he finally is brought back to Cambrai. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important, I guess, to note too, that the signs are experienced, you know, they're not like interpretation here for Deleuze is, is linked to experience. It's not something we sit down and do. So again, even at work in his reading, there's this uh, different way of thinking about philosophy. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not, none of this is as straightforward as we, you know, I, I, again, I would think of it in more of a Nietzschean sense, right. Where there's this totally, intense um reading happening which is also living mm -hmm. um and then finally you know the fourth kind of sign which is absolutely uh above all of the others is are the signs of art um so that picks up kind of where memory leaves off so so and Deleuze will get he he returns to the sensuous signs like a little bit later um and makes a distinction between the signs so within the sensuous signs right sensuous signs are already subservient to the signs of art but they're mm -hmm. the path there mm -hmm. but within the sensuous signs there are the signs of memory and then the signs more of like imagination so there are things in the novel that happen like the there are three steeples that at one point i think the narrator is in a um in a carriage and he drives by these steeples and on the the, the winding road the steeples kind of change position and mm -hmm. he it's the first thing that makes him kind of like want to write. So like he, he talks about like he, he needs to somehow express what he's feeling. And Deleuze says that that is always going to be um, superior to involuntary memory because it doesn't depend on simply the, even, even involuntary versus voluntary, which is even lower down. Like <laughs> even any reference to memory at all for Deleuze is like, eh, that's not it, you know, because it still depends too much on the material. Um, it, it's still, I mean, it's, it's, I guess, also a comment about representation, right? There's too much representation here. There's too much that's recognizable, which for Deleuze is just the recognizable is doxa. You know, it's, it's not, doxa. it's not creative. Yeah. It's like doxa, right? Like representation, right? what everyone knows, what we could all agree upon. Deleuze is concerned with like this purely creative. So imagination, even before the signs of art within the sensuous signs, imagination is always going to be, Mm. superior to memory because it's not just oh i remember that time you know yeah. like I, I remember this it's no i'm creating i'm i'm responding to this sign and my response is creative um so yeah i guess that's a that's like a little bit of a a summary of the signs i mean the signs of art um he says that they kind of shed light on all of the other signs retroactively which i think is is certainly fitting with the way that um the way that the novel reads, right? Like I, I already said that the narrator is constantly making these interventions into his, into his past, even within the scene where it's the present, if that makes sense. So like, there's a, I think one of the things I sent you that I wrote, there's a, um, it's this book chapter um, that I wrote on, on a particular scene in Proust where the narrator is like just having a bad day and he's really bored and kind of annoyed, you know, which is the perfect state to have an aesthetic experience for Deleuze, I think, because it mm -hmm. doesn't depend on goodwill. <laughs> um, but he's like, he's, he's with his friend and he's just, you know, not having a good time. And he says to himself, Oh, like, you know, I, he basically re narrates the scene to himself to, to try to give it an aesthetic quality. And then the next sentence he says, but I should have realized that, you know, I should have realized then that um, the very need that I had to to force to basically will myself into having an aesthetic experience proved that I was having no such experience. You know, so there's already even within this scene, which is in the present, there's an anticipatory. There's like a there's a point A to point B looking back on point A thing mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. happening, a zigzagging that's always happening. So and I think part of that is signs. Right. I mean, what he was doing in that present moment was mistaking or making some kind of error about what is aesthetic experience, um, what signs are in aesthetic experience, you know, like it's almost like a categorical error. Cause I, he talks about a rose, like the, 
um, uh, somebody gives him a rose and, you know, that always makes me think of Kant, right? In the third critique, the rose is like, you know, discussed as an image of beauty. Um, so there's almost this idea that, oh, well, rose is an aesthetic object. So if I just have a rose, then I'm having an aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. And the narrator says, no, absolutely not. You know, that that's, you could be having an aesthetic experience, but the fact that you have to try to have one means that you're not, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that both Deleuze and Proust are sensitive to the way that like, um, however, I, I think Deleuze lends it more force and makes it more explicit, but there is this cutting across categories that happens and that ha it happens because of experience. So again, this is another way that this is a very, you know, committed, I guess, mm. text, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a strange, isn't there, where Deleuze doesn't want to enter into any amount of re, recognition, re-presentation. Mm. Um, so, but that brings in this question of if nothing can be, if in this connection to memory, everything sort of falls away and it's it's nothing to do with that. Where is the difference coming in? Where is the newness? Where does that arrive from? Yeah, this is this is a part of Deleuze that I'm I'm still still remains a bit of a question for me because I think Deleuze, you know, he talks about internal difference. Mm -hmm. So so I think that a lot of that has to do with like how how we are apprehending something or how we're experiencing something. Like for for instance, with memory, um involuntary memory, you know, uh it's not simply we're sitting here and then we're remembering a past time. He says that actually, and this is, you know, if, if we realize that this is what's happening, I think this is how we get to the signs of art where when the narrator has the involuntary memory of Combray, it's not simply that he's remembering his childhood. He's actually experiencing Combray as it was, but wasn't experienced at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he's going through the motions of reliving a memory and this kind of easy way he's actually mm -hmm. experiencing what Deleuze would say the essence of Combray mm -hmm. um and I mean importantly where we have that involuntary memory is when the part called Combray begins so it's as if you know mimetically we could imagine that right then the narrator begins writing you know because the next section goes back to his childhood so it's not simply oh I'm remembering this it's actually fueling this kind of creative urge to to put pen to paper or, or whatever. Um, but, mm -hmm. but I think, so there's a difference there. It's not simply Combray is always the same thing. It's, it's that when he was, you know, when he was a child, he didn't know, uh, he didn't have, he was still at an early stage of his apprenticeship. I guess you could say he didn't have, um, he's reading the signs differently mm -hmm. now, I guess. So to ask a probably a fairly basic question, but a bit frustrating with the language. I mean, why why are these subjects doing this? What's this? What is this search then? What what what's this search for Deleuze throughout this alteration of time and sign? I mean, good question. I guess. I mean, with with Proust, I think there's there's something. I actually it, it it's kind of making me think of. Uh, an interview I just listened to, but um, I think there's something maybe this might not make sense or might be too, too basic as well, but um, maybe there's something universal about trying to think a subject, uh, a creative subject specifically, and, and just the question of why, not why did Proust write, but why does one write? Why, you know, why does one create? Why does one paint? I mean, this is clearly something that Deleuze is always asking, right? His, Francis Bacon book, um, anytime he mentions music, film, all of that, um, he wants to know why, why we do this. And I think all of the, you know, Nietzsche as well, all of these were Samuel Beckett, you know, why, why, why write, you know, why? And I think that part of it is trying to, trying to figure out, um, a lot of things, you know, why, why experience can be so intense, why, you know, what, what, if there isn't a guarantee or if there isn't someone to teach you how to read signs, how, how, how do we recognize certain signs, right? Like why does art have any beyond the sociological or almost like Bourdieu style idea of distinction, right? Like what, why do we care about art? You know, mm -hmm. if it's not about distinction, right? If it's not 
I mean, there is always going to be these kind of social capital things happening when we when we talk about literature, um, whether we want that or not. Um, but absent of that, like why why do we write? And I think you know it's it's to maybe one way Deleuze would put it is to like to to at least begin forming a question. You know, mm-hmm. maybe not answer it, but to to start articulating uh, a, a question or set of questions that we can work on i guess um mm. do you did you think he wants to answer it well there we go that's an, that's i mean the, the, every time i read this book i'm surprised about how he talks about the signs of art and this is where it almost to me feels a little i mean deleuze is already counterintuitive but it feels a little counterintuitive within deleuze to talk about essences and mm. you know but he is still a, he is like you said a philosopher's philosopher mm-hmm. you know he is still very much working within that framework even though he's trying to put it upside down um i mean i i think that maybe he wants to answer it but how it would be answered and what form that answer would take is is more the question you know mm-hmm. um because, and, and I mean, this brings me, I guess, to another really important, uh, he, he ends with this, and it shows up in other texts, as I've mentioned, but um, the image of thought, you know, mm. he says that Proust sets up a new image of thought. And it's not, it's contrary to, he says, it's it's contrary to the rationalist idea that we, we think, um, you know, we simply have thoughts through our goodwill and our intention. And, you know, it's almost this caricature of somebody sitting down and I'm, okay, I'm going to do thinking now, you know, he says, no, actually a thought occurs when vi- there's violence. He says violence prompts thought. Um, so what that is, is a sign, you know, a sign we can almost imagine coming out and emerging and we have an encounter with the sign. And as a result, there is thought. So thought is, um, thought is vital. Thought is creative and I mean, I I think you can wonder, yeah, what form then would philosophy take if if that's how we think? Um, I mean, I think it's an open question. I don't know if you can necessarily no, answer. No. And I don't think any of, the, any of the things it seems for Deleuze, any of the things that we're talking about, signs, the way we interact with time, uh, all these different types of signs, their sort of strange hierarchy, none of this is adequate to articulate. It, it's a, the, the, the articulation is only momentary. Um, and nothing seems to be adequate. Everything continues to unfold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, one of the things, um, about signs being adequate, I mean, the way I think about it is, you know, to me, that means, you know, is a sign complete? And I think like, no, you know, is an artwork complete? No, it can be finished, but you know, if it's complete, we wouldn't be writing about it, responding to it, critiquing Mm -hmm. it. You know, there's an ongoing dialogue and that's, I guess the beauty or that's the force of signs is that they have to be interpreted. And importantly for both Proust and Deleuze, you know, that interpretation might never happen, but the fact that it does happen, you know, and the contingency of that or the accidental nature of um, not only our encounter with the sign, but our like engagement with it, the fact that that is so it's left up to chance Mm-hmm. Uh, actually makes it all the more intense when it does occur, right? That's why it's necessary. So De- again, Deleuze is working with these um, very paradoxical, you know, but if you, you know, if you, I think, I think they hold, you know, I think reading Proust and I, I actually have a quote here um, from Proust that I, I wrote down um, <clears throat> that I thought of while I was reading this. So Proust writes, it's, it's early in the novel and he's talking about, um, He's talking about involuntary memory, but he Mm. says it is a labor in vain to attempt to recapture our past. All the efforts of our intellect must prove futile. The past is hidden somewhere outside the realm beyond the reach of intellect in some material object in the sensation which that material object will give us of which we have no inkling. And it depends on chance whether or not we come upon this object before we ourselves must die. So. I mean, even even what Deleuze is saying, you know, and, and there's a really, you know, he wrote so many monographs, right? He has all these books on one thinker. And I think in this book, he pretty successfully, like, is ventriloquizing Proust. And, and a lot of what he's doing is simply adding a bit more force to what Proust is saying. Because even here, there's, 
you know, the intellect, our intellect is powerless to do this, right? That's mm-hmm. a big point for, for Deleuze. Like thinking isn't really about the intellect. Intellect is a tool that we have in thinking, but, you know, there's something way more fundamental. And I think, you know, we can talk about like objectivity as well, but I think that there's, there's something, you know, there's almost a transcendence or, or something beyond subjective and objective for Deleuze mm-hmm. as well. Um, and I think it, I mean, I think it is a paradox. It's a counterintuitive thing, you know, I mean, the idea that you have an apprenticeship in life, you know, mm. uh, but well, maybe even, that's even the fact he manages to write this book without betraying his own thesis, right? This sort yeah. of notion of betrayal, whereby we might adhere to something so strictly, he manages to um, I guess it's because he always sta- he stays on multiple levels and he's always talking usually in a meta sense. Um, but he, he never manages to, well, he always manages, sorry, to not hold something down. It's, there's no notion of him betraying something that he's trying to articulate. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and this is what, you know, this is what makes this a great book, but also, it, I mean, I, 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 I say you, yeah, I do think this book is very, um, approachable but i think that whether or not deleuze is approachable <laughs> there are kind of two there are two ways that that means something where on the one hand a lot of his stuff is just so i mean it's specifically the writings with guattari um <laughs> it's so dense and mm. so um you know full of jumps i guess yeah. it feels very accelerated there is a lot of Nothing is, you know, there's absolute, if I say that this book doesn't have any close reading, there's no close reading. And, you know, there's, there's, Mm. there's a lot of jumping around that, that, that makes it really difficult to stay on the same page. And I think that was part of their project was to kind of like, accelerate thought or do something to thought that made that forced us, you know, did some violence to us that made us think in a different way. But here, you know, I find this book very approachable, because I, I think that he's right about about a lot of what he's saying about Proust, but I, but I also think not only do you have to read at least some Proust to understand this, you also have to understand, you know, a little bit about Proust scholarship and Proust's place just in the popular culture. And you also have to just like feel what Deleuze is saying. You know, I really think that like Deleuze is a great, great philosopher. If you, if you feel, you know, it's not just, he's saying this, it's, yes, you know, I, I agree with this or I feel this. And I think mm-hmm. that because of that, this book, um, yeah, this book is, is, is really striking in that way. Yeah. It's interesting a word you use there, this idea of, uh, how to approach. I don't think Deleuze, especially Deleuze and Guattari would want people to approach. So this notion of scholarship regarding Proust is itself like, slowly you know slowly approaching them and and finding some way to make sense of it i think deleuze would almost want people you know thrown in i always found there's a great irony in that i think the best way to read like the only person who could ever truly read anti-oedipus is the person who doesn't know what it is yeah 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 and you start in the middle right that's how you that's how to do it and like in the sense that you're trying to work it out you've already spoiled the book and in the sense of i guess the same methodology seems to be at work here is like you're almost always entering into a portrayal of the thing that you're trying to find via something intuitive or something imaginary etc yeah absolutely because that would be the only way you know starting cold and not not knowing who the author is not seeing the cover of the book getting in the middle middle of the book and just beginning there is the only way to encounter it out in the world right because Mm -hmm. otherwise Otherwise, there's this overdetermined cultural baggage. I mean, especially Deleuze and Guattari. I mean, you know, I think that um, it's unfortunate that I, I think I don't know. I guess, but it seems like, in at least in a pop, more popular sense, people are only reading, um, you know, Thousand Plateaus or Anti Oedipus. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to be found in these early books that what's interesting about those later books is all kind of already here. You know, I mean, Deleuze is a thinker who, who is, is most striking, I think for the way that he thinks, right. Mm-hmm. Like the, he thinks in a certain way, it's the same thing with Nietzsche where, you know, he, he was, he was working actively against presuppositions and against, so you can, you know, it's not an easy method to apply, I guess, and maybe sometimes not even easy to recognize what's going on. But if you see something like this, where, you know, 
not only is he doing a reading of Proust, he's at the same time, you know, saying a lot philosophically and like contradicting all of our assumptions about Proust, you know, like doing all of that in a, in a slim book, you mm-hmm. know, um, it's, it's, yeah. I, I think, think it's that, pretty- that's one of the, the oddities and oversights of a lot, maybe not oversights, but oddities of Deleuze is that many people think about Deleuze and they think of one of the most complicated and complex philosophers, the most difficult philosophers. And he is that, but at the same time, he's extremely simple. If he gives you a line, he gives you a line. And that's, you know, you don't, it's like you don't need any more than this. And this book is sort of emphatically a version of that. And we see this also in Bergsonism and all of his, you know, the Spinoza book as well. Um, This sort of, well, here's, here's the thought. Here's the here's what I've put down there, but it's only when he goes into his sort of there's the sort of like three Deleuze's right. There's Deleuze when he's doing his own philosophical work. There's the monograph Deleuze, and then there's Deleuze and Guattari, and like his own philosophical work, like difference of repetition, is most emphatically where you're gonna. That, that's the most difficult. I think he's strongest in his monograph monographs. Yeah, I think I would agree. Um... Because difference in repetition, I mean, I always go back to the image of thought chapter, you know, I mm. think that's a fantastic chapter. But again, it's it's here too, you know, and it's also in the Nietzsche book. So in, in a more condensed and, and, you know, happily, I have read Proust, so I, I understand the reference, it would be a little different if I, you know, if I, if I didn't, there, there's a learning curve there, I suppose, but, um, but certain parts of difference in repetition, I just need to reread over and over again. And I still, you know, I still don't, I mean, because he also has such, such strange references sometimes, Mm. right? Like some of the philosophers, like who's talking about Duns Scotus, you know, like, exactly. (laughs) so there's, there's, I think the way that also that he's drawing from um, sometimes irreverently, right. Mm. From, from other thinkers, um, shows some kind of courage, I guess, that he had, you know, um, yeah. as a thinker. Yeah. I mean, is there anything you'd, anything you'd like to add about the Proust and science text? Of course, you know, we've, we've only really glossed the surface of it, but in a certain way, is that all we can do? Um, let me think. I mean, I, I guess um, I would say the one thing that we – that I thought was kind of interesting that I, I kind of forgot from before was um, about the question of Proust being a, a Platonist. Mm-hmm. Um, so reading through and having that question in mind, I was, I was thinking in very, very basic terms, like, okay, you know, Proust was is talking about essences and, you know, um, and in the, in the conclusion though, he says, Proust is a Platonist, but not in the vague sense, not because he invokes essences or ideas, Plato offers us an image of thought under the sign of encounters and violences. In a passage of the Republic, Plato distinguishes two kinds of things in the world, those that leave the mind inactive or give it only the pretext of an appearance of activity, and those that lead it to think, which force us to think. Mm-hmm. So I, I actually did not, rem- like, in my reading, I, I, I stumbled upon that and I was just thought, wow, like, so he, he leaves this kind of at the end of this whole, you know, first hundred pages where he says that Plato is already offering us, you know, this new image of thought, um, which is, I don't know, it made me stop for a minute because I would think that, you know, in a philosophical text, you would maybe begin there or say, Mm -hmm. hey, Plato does this, Proust develops it or something like that, you know, but he buries it. Um, So, yeah, I don't I don't know if I have too much else to say about that, but I just thought that was kind of a fascinating you know, a little reminder that he is, uh, you know, reading the entire history of philosophy and trying to uh, suggest certain things about it, you know. Mm. Once again, with Deleuze, I'm not sure what to do with that. He gives you such interesting data, fuel, and you're never sure what to do with it. How would you How would you advise people to approach this text? So, yeah, I mean, as as we've been saying, I guess, I mean, as a reader of Proust, I think that this is a a very, you know, it's, it's a text. It's hard to, to do anything. You know, it's, it's not, again, like I've said, there's not a lot of quotation. There's not really any close reading and in it, I suppose in a way you can plot wise, you know, within the scholarship, unfortunately, I think, you know, there are certain passages that are just famous and Proust, which, you know, which happens with any text, right? We, mm-hmm. 
we think about Proust and we think, oh, you know, involuntary memory, that's essentially, and I think that's why this book is important. I think, you know, of course, involuntary memory is a, the way that Proust wrote it specifically is a very um, novel thing and a very important thing. Um, but, you know, as, as, a, as a way of activating like other possibilities of reading Proust, I think this, this book, again, as a scholar uh, or, you know, among the scholarship, uh, it's important for that reason. But it also, I think, is a good starting place for reading Deleuze. I think it was the first Deleuze that I read. And it, it really, it shows you what his priorities are, I guess, as a philosopher, right? So even if you're not thinking about Proust, I think being able to trace what he's doing, like what, the what, form are, what are his priorities? Uh, to, <laughs> that's okay, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, I mean, to try to, again, I, I keep thinking against the grain, like he's trying to think against the grain. He's trying to get away from these assumptions. And sometimes maybe that feels a little bit like a contrarian enterprise, but I don't know. I think here he's successful, you know, and that's, and that's why I say why I keep referring to the scholarship because, you know, um, the past, there, there are certain, in, in my own work, I've encountered this, you know, like, everybody writes about the Madeleine passage, you know, like everybody writes about certain things. And, and as Deleuze will say elsewhere, right, there's, we should be suspicious of what everyone knows, right? So this is part of thinking about thought differently, right? What everyone knows is is not really worth thinking about in a certain way, mm. you know, I think mm. that it's, 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 what everyone because, knows has already portrayed itself. Sure. Yeah. Because it's already been like sedimented or, you know, we, we, we take it for granted, you know, and we, in, in that, in that way, I think we lose the experience of, or, or we lose touch with, you know, what experience does and, and why it's important for thinking, you know, and why thinking is experiential. Um, mm. But so almost like we can't really draw any borders or limitations there that we can abide by. We just have to allow something. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think, it remains, I guess, a question like how anarchic uh, Deleuze is, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I think that a lot of the, the specifically the French thinkers of the 20th century get kind of painted with a broad brush. And I think that Deleuze stands out as a very, um, I don't know, still, still an important thinker, still mm -hmm. someone who's worth interrogating his works and specifically the, I, I mean, for me, specifically the idea of thought, you know, which is, of course, a fundamental philosophical idea, you know, what it is to think. Um, he, yeah, thinking, thinking this way, whether you're interested in art or philosophy, I think is, is, uh, this text is going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything you'd like to, to add about uh, Deleuze's Proust and Signs? And also, where can we find your own writing on this text? Um, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, I have like articles and book chapters, um, and I have like a lot of stuff forthcoming, but, um, mm -hmm. I guess, so my first thing on Proust came out in substance. That might be a good place to start. It's, uh, honestly, I would say just find, um, at, at the university of Buffalo comparative literature department, if you find like my page, I think it should have my email. So I'm welcome anybody to send me an email. I'm happy to send, uh, send any articles or things like that. Or if anyone wants to talk about this stuff more. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll be sure to put those links in the description below, but, um, Brian counter. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure.